Hello, and welcome to another episode of Insight Futures podcast, Time for Action. This is week three of our 12-week countdown to COP26, the 26th annual UN Climate Change Conference of Parties, which will be hosted in Glasgow from the 31st of October to the 12th of November. The focus for this week's episode is context. Our CEO, Doug Morwood, speaks with Cynthia Reynolds, founder and systems architect at Circular Regions, where they discuss what context is and how we can improve our current context for a sustainable future. So, handing over, we'd like to apologise for a few minor blips throughout uh, due to connection issues, something I'm sure we're all too familiar with these days, but it was well worth it to be able to reach our fantastic overseas guest speaker this week. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy this week's episode of Time for Action. Hi, I'm with Cynthia Reynolds, founder and systems architect for Circular Regions. We're going to explore context today, what it is and how can we improve our context. Cynthia, hi, how are you doing? Hi, I'm well. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So tell me a bit more about what you do and why Circular Regions was established. Uh, Circular Regions uh, is based in the Oslo region of Norway. And uh, it's a decentralized network supporting systemic place-based innovation for regional circular economies. And we've established the digital infrastructure to help map best practice business models, uh, policies, economic incentives, and educational behavioral shift resources to develop a shared intelligence with dynamic data. And what we're able to do is support networks, hubs, hotspots, clusters, cities and regions, regardless of their business model or the stakeholder level. Wow, that's that's a lot. Um, you're, you just broke down a wee bit there in the sound, so I'm just going to repeat the last bit. So you, you kind of, I think it was clusters, cities and regions, and it's regardless, regardless of business model or stakeholder level. That's right. So, so, so comes, sorry, carry on. Uh, when it comes to working with different networks, um, we can work with uh, industry networks. You can look at networks of social entrepreneurs. You can look at what's happening at uh, the public entity level. We can work with uh, in the knowledge sector. So it doesn't matter if it's sector based or, or stakeholder based. What we're able to do is to support them with data that is relevant to, to their work. And we're also able to do that regardless of their business model. Um, we can work with for profits or non profits. Excellent. So we're here to explore context or maybe ecosystems is another way of describing them. Um, that, uh, so how would you define the word context and, and how would you and, and mapping that context? Well, I think it's interesting. Context um, can also be taken out of context. And I think that's sort of the, the interesting play on, on this topic. Um, many people are talking about the concept of the circular economy. Um, and depending on who you're talking to, which stakeholder, um, they'll have a different view on what it is. And I think that when we look at context, we have to look at a holistic understanding of the circular economy to be able to understand each of our roles we play and how we can play context with each other to change the ecosystem and develop a new economic system. And so is context something where, you know, is it defined by place? Is it defined by themes, as you mentioned earlier, or groupings of stakeholders? I think it's about all of those things, but in a bigger holistic understanding. Um, it's about places working together with other places. Um, we often hear about cities and cities, they can't feed themselves. We have to look at a regional context there. And then the different regions have their own contexts. We're seeing... Um, for the Oslo region, for example, it's based around capital city. Uh, the work that we're doing in Umeå in Sweden, when we ask them what is their natural or economic region beyond what you see in the map, uh, they explain that it was actually a cross-border region because they have a ferry that goes to Vasa in Finland. So the context of a region for that area is very different. Whereas if you look at some place like Iceland, it's an island region because they have a natural delineation because of the geography. So I think we need to start establishing the context of different types of regions and then how we can work together with them, but also how we can take the data from one and apply it to another region, because this is about a global economy. How can we make all these places work together with all the stakeholders? So it sounds like a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, there's lots of pieces that need to fit together to create a bigger picture, but each of these smaller pieces may not know what's happening way over at the other side of the jigsaw puzzle, but they are, they're connected to each part next to them, I suppose, to, to create that cohesive whole. 
Um, I, I take it in terms of a shift from a linear to circular economy. That's a, 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 a kind of a political, an economic, a social shift. Um, do you, you obviously see a real need for for change from moving from a linear to circular economy? Absolutely, and I don't think we can make that change happen fast enough. Uh, I think I'm preaching to the choir to anyone who's listening to this podcast, but the time for change is now. And in order to, to make that change, we have to understand what's working and what isn't working. And we need data to be able to do so. That's the only way we can generally you know, understand the current situation and how we can find a better economy. Well, you mentioned data, and I suppose there's there's so many ways you can map context and stakeholders and, and the trends, um, the pestle influences, political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environment. But the, the customer needs that are changing, the demographic shifts, um, the disruptions that we've had, for example, the pandemic, or even just now in Afghanistan and the, the, the mobilization and just, you know, the, the displacement of people. Um, the, 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 I suppose the, the pressures on our planet with regards to even water, access to resources, access to affordable housing, access to jobs. You know, there's so much going on. Um, how do you see this management or the ability to manage all that data to make sense of it? I suppose sense making is a hugely important thing to be able to make more, I suppose, data informed decisions about designing and planning contexts or places. In, in, in regions or cities and regions or localities, but that have to work together as a cohesive whole for the benefit of the planet. There's, I think the data, what we need is dynamic data. And that's something that I am often speaking about. Data that we can then use based on the stakeholders' needs. How can we provide policymakers with data on impacts, barriers, and enablers? How can we get industry and SMEs to understand um, what they can do to find innovative new solutions, uh, identify new business opportunities, transition their model. Uh, how can we look at the data that's being shared amongst them as well and how we can start sharing that data in a better way so that we can change supply chains. And from a global context, uh, that is one of the biggest shifts we have to look at. We have to look at the entire global economy. And it's about, um, also you mentioned sort of uh, inclusive housing and, and better you know, um, uh, access to different solutions and services. Uh, I'm a real fan of the, the concept of leave no one behind. So we need to be able to take the data from the social aspect of things and not only look at the environmental and economic aspects of things. So how can we look at, at sustainable development and, and really find the impacts and identify the solutions that we need to scale and replicate and network? So it's, it's a, it has to be a just transition, as you say, no, leave no one behind. And I suppose there's a, a number of different disruptions, not just the current pandemic, but the, the fragility of the global supply chain. Um, I suppose the move to digital, um, you know, access to online um, is still, you know, there's a two, two and a half billion people in the world still don't have access to the internet. Um, but even in rural economies here in Scotland, you know, we've got a huge, a huge challenge around broadband and Wi-Fi access to rural communities. So if we're digitalizing, if Industry 4.0 is really, you know, still to kind of have a manifest impact on the way we live and work and, uh, and be with each other, the, the transition from working from an office to working from home to even how we are communicating just now on a screen and a, and a, and a digital uh, way. There's that that in itself, there's so many different disruptions, it seems, um, before we go into you know, famine and wars and displacement. How is it that we can, with COP26 coming up uh, in two months here in Glasgow where I am, you know, how is it that we can better uh, gather, analyse, present data? How can we... Uh, I suppose, um, generate more incentives from better mapping of context, better mapping of those who don't have access just now so that they can be not just catered for, but be contributing to the solution. I think it's interesting. Uh, you and I, we actually met in Glasgow at the... Uh at the, the hotspot back in 2018, I guess it was. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, and so what was interesting when I was there was I actually went on the tour for social enterprise and looked at a lot of the social enterprises in Glasgow. And what's interesting is you can take a look at the different business models and you can look at your traditional, you know, for profits, you can look at the innovative nonprofits. It's about sort of job creation. What the model is behind that is another story. But what are the impacts that they bring into a community? 
And so when I, when I saw some of the, the fantastic examples that were showcased in Glasgow um, regarding sort of bicycles, um, how you can get access to like local maker spaces, these are the things that when we have these disruptions like COVID and all of a sudden you aren't just working in downtown Glasgow, you are in your local community and you're working from home. I think places at a hyper local level are being highlighted and we need to, to work where our feet touch the ground. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to be able to map out the data and identify what's happening, what are the best practices of the business models, what are the variations behind them, and how can we look towards more regenerative models versus the traditional extractive models where they're just pulling away the profit. And that's about getting the data on the models themselves. What's the ownership behind it? Um, how is it actually um, using its profits? Are they reinvesting them into the community? And I think that once we get the data on the business models, we can learn so much more about what we can replicate in other places and network as well. And does context help in terms of maybe an island economy? You mentioned in Iceland, but you know, even here in Scotland, we've got a number of islands uh, off the coast, and they're a very different economy to the central belt where the big cities are, um, uh, the main cities in, Gla in Glasgow and Edinburgh. But even between Glasgow and Edinburgh, they're very different contexts, um, culturally, uh, historically. One's a post-industrial city, the other one's a kind of capital with the centre of finance and um, uh, legal and all that sort of thing. So, and they, yet they're only 40 miles apart. So this idea of context is really important to understand context and to to have that insight into the stakeholders, the levers, the needs, the current state, the future state. How would you see that, uh, you know, um, the mapping and understanding or greater insight of that is helping enable um, change to happen? Or and, and do you see that you said that the time for action is now, do you see change happening fast enough? I don't think it's happening fast enough. Um, and I think that that's why we have to start doing the mapping to identify the unusual suspects, to be able to show what are the, the things that, that are floating under the radar that really are truly impactful. Because I believe that some of the most impactful solutions out there are flying under the radar due to quite a lot of different barriers. And when we started identifying the data points for mapping, um, the barriers and the enablers broke down into five different categories. We have cultural barriers and enablers, social culture, social barriers and enablers, um, technological, marketing, regulatory. And so in the establishment of the, the data platform, we did a lot of stakeholder interviews. We interviewed uh, social enterprise. We interviewed big business. We did uh, the startup scene. We worked with public entities. And we also looked at um, people who were outside of the current workforce to say, what are the, the barriers, the enablers that you foresee, and what are the impacts of some of these solutions? And so by establishing a really solid, full, broad data set, we're in a position to be able to bring data that is in context to any location. And so you mentioned in, in Scotland, and um, recently, Helen, from... Um, as Zero Waste Scotland was presenting in Canada with me, the, uh, the Cities and Regions Initiative. And she spoke of the highlands and the islands and the economies there and the social enterprise that are in these smaller areas. And if we can start identifying what works in one area, how can we network and replicate these? Because that's what we need to scale them, to scale the impact. So the idea that that you can be trying some things in one context, but it could be that you can create models that travel as well to similar contexts. So whether that's urban environments, rural economies, island economies, or just whether there are similarities, obviously there needs to be um, what I call a deep hanging out. You really need to know where, you know, who, what the cultural dynamics, the social dynamics, the market dynamics, the political, you know, all the things you mentioned there, but there are potential opportunities to create um, almost system for changing the system models that you through, through context analysis. Um, yeah. And that then allows the, the lessons learned, the, the, the models to travel, the, 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 then the connections between contexts to build up. I suppose that's, that's something that you've seen uh, in your journey through circular regions, yeah? Absolutely. You mentioned urban and rural. Um, the location context is actually one of the, the data points that we are collecting with any initiative. Um, I have a background in food systems. And I can guarantee you that an urban local food distribution solution can't be replicated in a rural community and vice versa. 
So how can we take an initiative and understand where it functions well? Uh, so we're gathering whether it's something that's that's in an urban, peri-urban, or rural community, or whether it isn't applicable, whether it can be anywhere. Because if we want to say, what can we do with a certain waste stream in a rural community? I mean, most of these rural communities will have similar waste streams, um, that uh, whether it's through household, through local business, but also compared to agricultural data. How can we take what's working somewhere and replicate it elsewhere? And I mean, one of my favorite examples, um, there's a, a fantastic social entrepreneur here in Oslo, um, and she runs a company called Gruten, and they uh, collect coffee grounds from all local cafes and restaurants and produce mushrooms. And I'm sure you've heard of that concept before. I know of six different ones in Europe. And if we were to start connecting them and enabling them to establish a model that allows them to share their their business model, their packaging, their best practice, their social media, all of the, the ways that they can actually have a better, more functional business. Think of the change we can make. And then when you identify that it's not in another city, how can you almost franchise that for that matter? And enable these waste streams to be utilized in a way that can be done anywhere. So this is the data that we need to get. Yeah, no, that's fascinating, Cynthia. You've actually exposed our business model. Um, <laughs> because we are looking to codify practice around place-based innovation and how can we then, you know, create models that travel that then can be franchised or licensed so that you get that, you know, drawing down the design, the, 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 you know, the, the kind of know-how so that you're not having to go through the same pain process to get to a certain stage. You can just draw down that and then make it, uh, you know, location uh, relevant. Uh, but then how can you then scale that and, and then have that connectivity so you then create more and more data sets and more and more data points into a shared platform that then is able to scale the impact. So you don't need to be thinking, and I suppose for global organizations who are, you know, maybe offshored or have of, of used a globalized kind of approach in terms of their business model and the supply chain, um, a lot of them are having to now start looking at distributed manufacturing, local circular economies, so instead of, you know, it used to be big as best, it's now fast as better. So, you know, um, it used to be, as I think Klaus Schwab said, the big fish, they used to eat the small fish. Now it's the fast fish that eats the slow fish. So, you know, maybe that nimbleness, but connected through, you know, shared platforms, um, data sharing, knowledge sharing, lessons learned, case studies, you know, that may be the way that we could accelerate once we have proven ways of doing things, pull down into the you know the, the kind of the local context in a sensitive way yeah. that then can be you know able to scale. Um I think that there's you know obviously there's a lot of um disruption going on just now and and as human beings we're very resistant to change as organizations were very resistant to change and systems were very resistant to change. I just want to finish with a quote from Buckminster Fuller who said you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Do you think that's the only way we can go forward? Or do you agree with that? Or do you think there's other ways that we can help the current system, the current context, to shift in a more just and, and fair way, but also in a more accelerated way? Uh, that quote is one of my all-time favorites. I have used it in many blog posts over the years. And I do believe that we need a new economy. We need a new system. And in order to do so, we need to identify what works best and build around that. And for those who have the ability to transition their models and come on board and be able to make that transition from the old economy to the new one, great, Godspeed, like encourage everyone to do so. But if you are not part of this new economy, we need this change. Um, there has to be a way to identify what works, and then create the, the right economic incentives and the policies that make the old models obsolete. They, they won't be able to function going forward. And I think in order to develop those policies, this is where we need the data. We need to have better decision support tools because right now the decision makers are tasked and mandated to create the policies that will make this change for us. But we need to provide them with what they need to know to do it right. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think that's a, a really good point. It's that collaborative um, coalition around policy, legislation, taxation, public sector, private sector, communities, social groups, the third sector. Um, so mapping and understanding current context, the stakeholders, the levers, 
and incentives, as you mentioned, that need to change to incentivize new behaviors, um, they're critical to successfully manage change, whether incremental or radical. Final question then, do you believe we're going in the right direction? Well, that's a good question. Um, yes, I think we are going in the right direction and we have a lot of people on this team pulling in that direction. And what we need to do is to get everyone else on board. And I think every day we're seeing that people are realizing this is, it's time for a change. People are, are changing their jobs, they're changing their, their patterns of behavior. And, and I think that, um, yeah, it, it, it's happening. It's going in the right way. And we just have to spread the word and get out of the, our own little bubble and make sure that everyone else comes on board. That's uh, the key to getting us there. Well, thanks very much, Cynthia. It's been really illuminating hearing you discuss context. And, I th and I'm sure there's more and more people um, listen to the podcast and, and, and f have other uh, sources of information, then they're going to get on board, as you say, and, as, as, and get that collective tipping point. So th once again, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Well, folks, that was our CEO, Doug Morwood, and Cynthia Reynolds of Circular Regions discussing context. Links to social media channels can be found in the description. Tune in next Friday, where we'll be joined by another guest speaker to look at levers for change. Thanks for listening and enjoy the weekend.